Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 9th, 2017, and today's episode is being recorded in front of a live audience at the Hoover Institution on the campus of Stanford University. We have three guests today. Nicholas Crafts, Professor of Economic History at the University of Warwick. Louis Garricano, Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. And Luigi Singales, Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, where he's also Director of the Stigler Center and is also a former EconTalk guest. Gentlemen, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you. Our topic for today is the economic health of Europe and the possibilities for growth. I'd like each of you to make a very short opening statement on what you see as the major challenges that face Europe today. And we'll start with Nick, Nick Crafts. Seems to me the major challenge that faces Europe is its productivity performance. Productivity, the increase in output per hour worked or whatever, is central to the increase in living standards over time. Since about 30 years ago, productivity growth in Europe has halved, and some projections for the future say it might fall to a third of its original level, below 1% a year. My take is it doesn't have to be like that, because in particular there's likely to be scope to exploit rapid technological progress. I think some of the current uh, difficulties are basically still temporary and related to the financial crisis. And it is possible there could be improvements in policy. But improvements in policy would really be needed to deliver that fast growth future. And the sort of things that I think Europe is particularly bad at compared to the United States are things which you might loosely call creative destruction. The entry of the new, the exit of the old, and a flexible labor market which redeploys work as well. And that's probably the dark side of this technological future. If the technological change we're looking at is essentially going to have a strong factor-saving bias in it, and create massive adjustment problems at, let's call it, the bottom end of the labor market, then it seems to me many European countries are less well-placed than the United States, say, to deal with that. It's always a challenge to reform supply-side policy, but it's going to be even more of a challenge, I think, in future, because what we have in some European countries, it's the background to Brexit, is a set of left-behind voters. And the big issue, I think, for Europe in future is how to restore prosperity and grow quickly while keeping the left-behind voters on board and stopping them from sinking the ship. Same issue in the United States, I'm afraid to say. Uh, Luis Garricano. Yeah, I agree with Nick that the uh, productivity is the the big issue. And I think further than than the UK and the United States, uh, in the European periphery, uh, it has been a problem for for a longer period of time. Uh, in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, etc. Productivity growth didn't really pick up in the, 90, in the 1990s and actually has been very low. In Spain, negative. TFP growth was, 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 was negative since, 90, since the mid-90s. And the question is why? Uh, Luigi has a paper, um, he'll probably talk about it later with Pellegrino, in which he says, well, the usual suspects are not going to be enough because in the same countries were growing very much uh, previously. So the question is, what changed? And I think there are two candidates to what changed in the mid-90s that could interact with what the European periphery and some other countries have, which are the problems that they have, which are finance and technology. Finance, basically, the advent of the euro meant there was a lot, let's say, a lot of money. There was a lot of easy financing, a big drop in in rates. Um, And with a lot of money, Gita Kopinov has 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 a paper arguing that um, money is more directed, financing was more directed to the large-scale firms and not to the better firms. Um, I have some work with, with Joseph Villaverde and Tano Santos arguing that when there is so much money, a bit like Buffett says, when the tide is high, you don't see who's swimming naked. Uh, the money goes a bit indiscriminately, finance went a bit indiscriminately to, to bank savings, banks, to bad firms, etc. So that's one possibility. After the crisis, the finance was still a problem because zombie, zombie firms have been really a really big problem in these countries, as Gowan and Andrews in a very recent paper uh, have shown. So that's one possibility. The other is technology, 
technology really started hitting the U.S. positively in the mid-90s. Why would uh, European firms be less good at that? I would say uh, firm size is a problem. Um, I, I just published something in the AR in, in November uh, showing that uh, firm size regulations were important in France in, in, in not allowing firms to grow. Uh, technology is complementary with size, and you, you see that you need to be a large firm. Maybe some small firm could adopt technology, could, could be productive before, uh, in a way that with information technology you need to be ma- much more organized and much more formal. Uh, managerial quality is also something that is related to size, and managerial quality is a problem in the periphery, as, as is human capital in general. So all those are things that are kind of hard to, to change, and I agree with Nick also that, that policy has to change if those things are, gonna, are going to improve. And one thing that you, that you see when you're getting a bit close to, to policy is that uh, desire to change some of those key things that you would need, regulations that restrict firm growth, that restrict reallocation. I didn't talk about reallocation, but that's also a key, huge problem. Um, It's really harder and harder to do those changes in regulations because of demographics, because these countries are getting old, and old people don't like change. Mm -hmm. Luigi Sengales. The challenge of having a last name started with a Z is that you come always last. And so you have to be very creative in adding to what people say before. So I perfectly agree that the most important thing is productivity. And I agree, of course, with what Luis said, uh, of the differences between northern and southern Europe in the ability to uh, incorporate uh, the what is called the ICT revolution, information and communication technology revolution. I think those are, are very important. Uh, but uh, by, at, at some level, these are present also in the United States, as, as you mentioned earlier. So if you want to point out what is really unique in terms of challenge of Europe, I think it's the institution of the European Union and particularly of the common currency. I think that those are really the challenging institutions that uh, need to adapt or might create a big disaster. Uh, as economists, we know that uh, uh, the EU has been created assuming that eventually there will be the institution to support it. Uh, And uh, no economist uh, worth this name thinks that uh, the institutions are there. And uh, uh, eventually, there was, I think, Herbert Stein that was saying that uh, if something is unsustainable, eventually it will not be sustained. I think that that applies to everything, including the euro. And uh, and, uh, unfortunately, the underlying theory under which sort of Europe was created, that is the so-called Monet theory, that uh, you push farther and you create a chain reaction that makes inevitable to move forward uh, might actually lead to the meltdown. It's a chain reaction to the meltdown because uh, this is the worst possible moment to create those institutions because there is a reaction against globalization and uh, there is a a very inward-looking nationalist uh, uh, sense. And uh, I think that part of it is that in Europe, uh, the common institutions that are being associated with market and globalization, and the protective institutions like the welfare state is at the national level. So when you have a moment of crisis, uh, it's natural that uh, you run toward the nationalistic view, because if you want to be protected, you don't see uh, Frankfurt or, or Berlin as a sort of protection. You see your national capital as a source of protection. And uh, I've been trying to tell everybody that if you want Europe to survive, you need not only create a banking union, but also create a a federal uh, unemployment insurance uh, that will work not only economically, but also politically, because at least the unemployed will see all of a sudden the symbol of Europe associated with something positive. At the moment, the symbol of Europe is only associated with negative things. Who's going to run that that welfare plan? What's, uh, what's the political we, structure we, that could possibly overlay? We, no, no, no. We, do, we do something much more complicated, which is to uh, have a common system of regulation of banks. There is now a banking union, at least there is half of the banking union, the half that uh, the Germans allowed, because there is the other half that did not allow, but the half which, that they... Which half is that? Uh, the common de- deposit insurance. No, now there, there is a common supervision and a common insolvency rules. 
which I think are great. Actually, I, I don't I don't mind that at all. But this should be the third leg, which is the, the common deposit insurance. And uh, my understanding, some Germans would say the opposite, but some my understanding is that uh, they initially agree to the, the common framework, and then they put other conditions to delay the introduction of the the sharing component. Uh, but uh, if you think that it's easy for a German to supervise an Italian bank or for an Italian to supervise German banks, is as difficult as it is for a German to supervise an Italian employment insurance and vice versa. So if you don't trust the other group, which is a big issue in Europe, uh, you can have the Germans run the Italian system and the Italians run the German system. Yeah, it seems to me the cultural challenge there is that if you don't feel like a European, if you still feel like a German, right, or... or yeah, but, but, then, but then you draw the conclusion that it's not feasible. Well, that says, would seem to be a Louis possibility. <laughs> uh, I want, let me hear what the other guests have to say. Louis, yes. go ahead. So, so um, I, I agree that the institutions we've given ourselves are not, are not, are not working. So just to, because the audience is probably not as familiar, essentially there is a common stabilization or fiscal policy framework that is imposed by Brussels. And Brussels tells you whether you need to cut your deficit or you're allowed to spend more or less. Obviously, that's never going to work because it restricts massively the freedom of each country to face um, its own trade-offs. And it really, for people in this, in this environment, means some unelected guy somewhere very far from my country is telling me that I can't spend more in roads, which, I mean, I, I want to do. So it's no wonder that with this regime, there's a lot of resentment of the North in the South, if you, if you allow me to put it this way. Uh, and, and the commission, which is the institution that is supposed to enforce this, is losing prestige and is getting beaten up by everybody. So on that part, I, I agree with Luigi, and also on the, on, the, on, the, on the banking insurance. Of course, the banking insurance has massive, massive moral hazard risks. If you, if, if you insure the Greek banks... Uh, with German money, then what's to prevent the Greek government saying all mortgages are pardoned or in some way or another? Um, so, so these are things that are... But, are, but, but sorry, the, the insurance comes after you bail in 8% of liability. Yes. Something that the Americans never did. It says, why in Puerto Rico there is not a bank run? is because the FDIC insures Puerto Rico. Why in Greece there was a bank run? Because there wasn't such an institution. No, so no. you cannot run a country as a union without the fact that a dollar in Puerto Rico is worth as much as a dollar in New York. I think in, that's in essential. In Europe, that's Agreed. not true. I agree. It's not, it's not true in Europe, and it needs to change. But I'm just saying the obstacles are, are, are enormous. Uh, the one thing that I would, I would ask Luigi, and, and I, I, in terms of how the euro is functioning, is that in spite of all these things, Spain has recovered competitiveness, and Spain, Spain is growing really rapidly right now, um, whereas Italy essentially hasn't grown since uh, 95, I would imagine. I don't know how long. So I don't know why the constraint is hitting so much harder uh, Italy than Spain, although you could say, well, Spain just was, had a bigger recession. It's just recovering it, and it's getting to the place where Italy was all along. I think that Spain always worked better in the last 20 years. Uh, Spain had a real estate bubble and a crisis associated with that. But uh, I think the fundamentals were much better. I think that the, the real comparison is with uh, Portugal and Greece, and uh, they were not doing particularly well. Uh, Greece was doing a bit better before the crisis, but basically because they spend somebody else's money, it's easy to grow, they spend on somebody else's money. But uh, I think in terms of productivity, they were bad before, and they're still pretty bad. Yeah. Let me ask Luigi two questions, if I may. Uh, one, I think, to go back to what Russ was raising. To fulfil your proposal, we really need a transfer union, don't we? Uh, in which, it would turn out, Germany would pay the unemployment benefits of Southern Europeans, as they would see it. Let, let me uh, say that's a caricature, of course, mm -hmm. but you, you get the idea. That's the thing which seems to me ultimately politically infeasible. Second point I, I'm interested in your thoughts about is a British politician not so long ago described the Eurozone as a, build, a burning building with no fire escape. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that approximately the problem? The, if there had been an easy way to dissolve it, what would have happened five years ago would have been like the collapse of the gold standard in the 1930s. The fact that it didn't collapse like the gold standard in the 1930s, I think tells you that it's extraordinarily difficult to dismantle. Putting it very crudely, could you dismantle it without, as Barry Eichengreen says, creating the mother of all financial crises? 
Okay, I think both are excellent questions. On, on the first one, I don't want a permanent transfer union. I, will, I want a risk sharing mechanism. Uh, I come from Italy. I know how dangerous it is a permanent transfer from the north to the south. It did not work and did not improve the situation. Um, I remind you that in the middle of 2000, 2005, 2006, in unemployment insurance would have gone the other way around. It would have gone from the south to the north, to Germany. And that's exactly what an unemployment insurance is about. This is when, when in Texas there is an oil bust. Uh, they benefit from the Massachusetts tax revenues, and vice versa when there is an oil boom. Uh, that is a form of, of uh, union. And uh, if you think this is infeasible because uh, in, uh, there is not a sense of solidarity, we know that you are more willing to share with people that uh, you perceive, for whatever reason, more alike. So people don't resent transferring money to Mississippi from uh, California, Which, I think, they, they do resent transferring from uh, Germany to Greece. I think part of the problem is that uh, for, I mean, we have to recognize as, a, as economists that in the same way as we don't really know how to differentiate structural from budget, from, from cyclical in budgets, we don't know how to differentiate structural unemployment from cyclical unemployment. So any mechanism you set up is going to inevitably, and I am somebody who is in favor of, 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 of a common employment insurance, but is going to inevitably have a component of a structural transfer from north to south. It's, it's very no, hard actually, to avoid. I, I, you... I would say exactly the other way around, because right. the way I will structure this uh, unemployment insurance will be on uh, unemployment which is above the structural level of unemployment. And how do you and, measure that? And uh, the same way in which we measure the structural budget. We don't know how to do the it. Budget, I understand, but it, I don't think it's, it's unfeasible. It is I think would be... Okay, look, let me tell you what the structural level of unemployment in Spain is now, according to IMF, the OECD, is 18%. 18? Mm -hmm. 18. Do you believe that? Yes, because long term, it, it, this has been very high. It, unemployment in Spain has been very high, and they will create an incentive to actually reduce that number. So the incentive, the moral asset, is actually the other way around. Because if you have a system that where you are only receiving transfer on top of the structural unemployment, you're going to push down the structural unemployment, which is exactly what you want to do. If you know how so, to do it. I, I guess the issue, my first thought is, we should move on to another topic. My second thought is, <laughs> that's my first thought. My second thought is, this is the only topic, right? This is what the European question fundamentally is. Is there such a thing as Europe? And Luigi, you want to say, well, you know, you favor that system. This would be better. You have to get the people of these countries to feel that solidarity, the cultural connection that they evidently don't feel. I don't see how you're going to get around that. And that seems to be a fundamental constraint on moving forward in any organized way. No, I, absolutely. I'm not saying we should more move in that direction. I'm saying that if we don't move in that direction, we should recognize that the marriage is not working and we find we have an amicable divorce. Well, let's move on okay. to that. I like that. <laughs> let's, like divorce. let's talk about that for a minute. It won't be our only topic the rest of the time, although I'm sure we could spend the whole time on that too. But let's talk about that. Is there a – well, let's talk about Brexit in particular, which is a – I'd say a separation, mm -hmm. not a divorce, right? It's mm -hmm. a temporary – it's a period of cooling off until no. uh, legislation – might it's be a put true in place divorce. For, it's for, a true divorce. Well, on paper it's a divorce, <laughs> but it isn't yet. <laughs> talk, about, talk about the significance of Brexit for the constraints it puts on the rest of the European nations and the, and the Union as a whole, and whether you think it's going to actually happen and what its significance will be. Uh, you know, a lot of people speculated early on that, oh, it'll be awful because people are going to punish them. They're not going to agree to any any of the uh, possible alternative, say, trade agreements. They'll just say, you left, uh, we're done with you. We don't know how that's going to play out. Um, but I'm curious what you, what you think. Nick? I think this is a divorce, and I think it might become a quite bitter divorce as well. I've already started in jokes when I give talks in Europe to say, you Europeans. <laughs> Whereas I always used to say, we Europeans, of well, when, when you say you've started, for a minute I thought you were going to actually say you've changed your portfolio. But, <laughs> but, but, but a joking reference is a beginning. Go ahead. OK. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing about Brexit is it involves disintegration of trade. That is much easier, it seems to me, than disintegration of the financial system, and it will be a challenge for Europe in future, because there may be others who want to follow the path. Why do I think it's certain to happen? 
I think the Conservative Party politics make it certain to happen, and we have a Prime Minister who's essentially a party manager more than any kind of thinker. Uh, I don't think there's any escape. I think, moreover, that because in Britain the priority being given is to controlling immigration, uh, free movement of labour has become taboo for the Conservatives. In that case, you have to leave the single market. Essentially, you can't be in the European economic area. We're going down the path of what in the jargon is a hard Brexit. That might mean reverting to just being another WTO member facing the common uh, ECEU tariff. In fact, I think World Trade Organization. I'm sorry, yes, yeah. World Trade Organization. I think that's quite likely. This will be costly to Britain. I have little doubt about that. It's one of the very few things things the British economics profession is virtually unanimous on. We can't put an absolute figure on the cost, but it's probably going to cost Britain in the steady state 5 or 6% of GDP, something like that. It's non-trivial, but it's a cost that the British public uh, seems in one way or another to be willing to pay. There is a constituency for and a majority for Brexit. The, anonymity, the unanimity of the um, opinion of what what the consequences would be is not quite as convincing to me as it might otherwise be. Um, there was, of course, in the aftermath of Brexit, uh, as there was in the aftermath of our recent election, many wise and illustrious economists predicted disaster that didn't happen. Uh, is there any reason to think that perhaps the most pessimistic view is not as bad as it, as it may be? The short term is about macroeconomic forecasting. We know that economists are pretty bad at that when uh, unpleasant (laughs) shocks arise. The long-term steady state is about the analysis of the empirics of international trade. Trade costs go up, trade goes down. We know that less trade means basically lower income. The direction of the effects is unambiguous. Uh, There is clearly some doubt about exactly what the magnitude is. Totally agree with that, but I want to go to Luis, who raised a related question that I want to, in his opening remarks. So it's true. It's conceivable that there will be less trade because there will be less integration. It's not clear that the post-Brexit trade agreements will be as attractive through the WTO or whatever methods are available. But there was also a claim that I've heard often that Brussels was a big impediment to growth. And by getting out of the uh, Brussels regulatory umbrella, British firms will be more flexible. And Luis referred in his opening remarks to say firm sized regulation. I assume you're referring to situations in parts of Europe where once you reach a certain size, certain regulations kick in. We have that yeah. here. That keeps firms at 49 employees, for example, or 199. Obamacare, for example, is at 49. What is? Obamacare. Yeah. Is so, so talk about whether you think there's anything, so, is so, there an upside to Brexit economically that's beyond the trade story? So, so my analysis is very similar to Nick's in that um, the thing that the, the, the British public hasn't ever been told is that uh, the UK is essentially a service exporter and that services, uh, financial services, educational services, health services, essentially rely on common rules to be exported and on people moving. I mean, you export uh, law by Tourism. having people come to buy law. You export it. I export education as an LSC professor by having somebody from, from China who comes. <laughs> now, that means that you need uh, – people have all these – all these stories in newspapers or Brussels or like just to have bananas which are straight and all these things. And at the end of the day, these are just simple trade rules that if you, if you want to have a common, especially a single market on services, you're going to need to have. So I do think that the long term for the UK and the economy that exports services and, 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 and these kinds of services in particular is, is not great. I don't think, it's a, I don't think there, is, there is a lot of upside on this. Um, and I also think that there is a, a misconception on the whole uh, migration debate that has never been really mm, – the, the, the government has never tried to address in terms of the whole demographic situation, which is catastrophic in Europe and is much better in the UK. And, and so – Explain. Well, I mean, the UK has been getting – significant amount of immigrants and immigrants who learn English and who by and large integrate well. There is not the problems that you see in France with integration of immigrants or in Brussels in Belgium. And uh, that is a huge competitive advantage for the UK in terms of 
uh, a future where the welfare state in Europe is becoming asphyxiating, where these countries are just not going to be able to, to, to maintain these, these levels of, of this welfare state. So, so I do think in those two terms, in terms of exports of, of services and trade, and in terms of the uh, movement of people, the demographics, um, I think that the UK is shooting itself in the foot. But I agree with Nick that the British public is, is determined. I'm not sure that they were agreeing with incurring the costs. In the campaign, I think the biggest summary, the best summary of the campaign is Boris Johnson's uh, yeah. statement on, on, the, on the issue of cake. My policy is having it and eating it. Uh, <laughs> and, and he uh, basically, and they campaign on, on, a, on a point that we are going to, all these Europeans are so desperate to trade with us, cars, etc., that we're going to have all the good things of Europe, but we won't have to have all these common rules not contribute to the, just, uh, to, the, to the budget, not have a common court, and not agree to freedom of movement. And the truth of the matter is, over time, the government has been adopting the position. The phony war is over. The government has seen that that's not possible. And indeed, as Nick is saying, they're going towards hard Brexit. My sense is that this is looking very bad. Two years is very short. Uh, Fair enough. You need to get a deal in two years. You need to get not only just a deal on budget and all these things which are difficult, but you need to get a new free trade agreement, which is not, I think, possible, but it will be negotiated in this time. Plus, there is not a lot of goodwill from the two sides to get the best deal. So my, my sense is that this is looking really uh, not great. You want to add anything, Luigi? Yes, in a sense, if uh, this divorce does not seem to be very pleasant, uh, the euro divorce, as Nick was saying, is going to be much, much worse. I think that uh, it's not going the, euro to be, was the, the, the euro was designed with that fire escape. It was done clearly on purpose. There are statements of people involved that say we want sort of a... Um, I don't know whether this is true or not, but the myth is that... Uh, when uh, Cortes tried to colonize uh, uh, or succeed in colonize Mexico, burn his ships when he came. I think it's a correct. Uh, in, uh, in, in order to sort of uh, create a commitment, uh, the European did the same. Now Cortes was lucky enough to win. If he didn't, it would not have been pleasant. <laughs> and the European seems to be losing. And uh, the future is not sort of pleasant. Uh, I think that the easy way out exists, but is, this is politically unfeasible. The easy way out is for the stronger northern countries to get out of the euro from the top. Mm. Uh, they will create a northern euro, uh, also we label new euro, and uh, sort of uh, that will make it very easy for the southern country. The real problem is where you put France. Because <laughs> for the French, France belongs to the Northern Europe. Uh, they call the Southern European Club Med, and it's not a compliment. Uh, and, uh, but economically, I think, belongs to Southern Europe. So that, what do you I mean? think, is Ex the problem. Explain what you mean by that. So if you look in terms of uh, productivity growth and uh, ability to export and uh, efficiency, etc., uh, France looks much more like uh, Spain and Italy and Portugal than uh, looks more like uh, Finland uh, or, well, or productivity Germany. levels are great. Productivity levels in France are good. Are, are better. I'm not sure they are good. They are better than the one in, in, uh, in the other countries. But, uh, but still, uh, I don't think it's great. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I think that that's, that's a real tension. And, but even, even uh, ignoring France, I think that would be very hard. In a sense, the reality is that uh, Germany is benefiting tremendously from an undervalue euro in this moment. Now, actually, the economy is getting a bit overheated, so they're going to try to push for a, a rise in interest rates. Uh, but uh, in uh, the rest of uh, Europe, in particular, the southern part of Europe is uh, suffering tremendously. And uh, we are ignoring the fact that Greece went to an episode which is much worse than the Great Depression. So we sort of, I was at a debate with other people uh, on Europe, and they said the euro works relatively well. So that depends where you look where you it from. <laughs> yeah, and he says from the point of view of Frankfurt or Berlin, absolutely. From the point of view of Greece is a disaster. Now, they have a lot of responsibility. I'm not trying to say that all the responsibility. The, the Greeks have a lot of responsibility. But uh, will the United States go through a Great Depression without doing something? I think the right, the right way to think about it is, yes, they've made some problems, but their ability to deal with those problems was hampered dramatically. Is what Absolutely. You're saying, right? Absolutely. I mean, one thing that is, that is important not to forget is that the European public... And I agree with that, on that with the European public. That's like the euro. Um, the, the support for the euro is, is strong. 
um, and in part is because the countries of southern Europe, which are the ones who would benefit from the valuation potentially, they know that they cannot trust their government to run their own currency. Except so, for Italy. The support for the euro in Italy is 50-50. Hmm. And, uh, and all, basically, the major parties except uh, the Democratic Party are now supporting some form of exit from the euro. In, uh, they don't say exactly how because there is no fire escape, so you can't sort of uh, say, but that there is. And even Renzi in his latest incarnation has become much more anti-European. So I don't know where we are going. I think we're going to crash against the wall, but that, that's to me, is a, is a really big problem. Yeah, one way to, if there's no fire escape, you can just burn down the whole thing, and then if a few people survive, at least they'll get out, because <laughs> there's no more structure. That's a like a great thing. <laughs> Isn't it cheerful? Nick, do you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to finish off, perhaps, or come back on Brexit, and your question about is there an upside, because you've got more policy freedom on things like regulation and so on. I can think of... It could a, be a downside, of course, too. Yeah, <laughs> I think it will be. So let me make the argument very quickly. There are a large number of things I think are wrong with British policy in those areas. Innovation policy, infrastructure, land use planning, education. I could go through a very long list. They're what the OECD would call horizontal industrial policies. They are entirely within Britain's national competence. They are not precluded from change by being in the EU. The problems to reforming them lie in Westminster, not in Brussels. If you ask what exit would allow, it would allow more selective industrial policy and assuming uh, removing constraints on competition policy. Those are the constraints which have served Britain very well in terms of preventing a return to the 1970s. The 1970s in Britain was a disastrous decade, and one of the features of it was saving failed businesses in the name of the public interest and suspending competition policy and so on to do so. So I don't really think there is an upside there. Trying to make, trying to make creative destruction illegal, which is not <laughs> always... Which, which you can do, it's just, it just, it just very costly. Let's turn to productivity, which is an issue, of course, it's an issue here in the United States. People are worried about uh, the stereotypical view of the uh, European problem from uneducated Americans like me would be that European labor markets are particularly not dynamic. There are tremendous constraints on creative destruction, particularly with the movement of, of labor into new sectors. To what extent is that a European problem? To what extent is a particular Country problem. I mean, if Spain's unemployment rate really is something like 18 percent structurally, that's an unmitigated disaster. I mean, it's horrifying, right? So, is is it true? Uh, to what extent do you think it's true that, say, in particular, labor market regulations are reducing productivity or growth in, in general? I, I think it's uh, it's impossible not to not to conclude that uh, it is it is the case that the the distribution of productivity across firms in Europe is much more heterogeneous than in other places, particularly in Southern Europe. There is much more heterogeneity in the productivity distribution uh, compared to the U.S., for example, or to many other places. Uh, the bad firms persist, uh, the good firms don't grow, and that has a lot to do with a whole range of, of, of regulations that make it hard to grow, make it hard to hire, make it hard to adjust, and um, it's, it's very very hard to, to change. Essentially, the way that European countries introduced flexibility was to, was to temporary employment. There is a, uh, a, in many countries, not just in Southern Europe, but also in Holland, there's a dual labor market uh, with very flexible temporary contracts and extremely rigid civil service-like uh, permanent contracts. And what it means is that essentially if you're a young person, you are even more precarious than in any other place because you essentially can't climb into the protected sector of the economy. Um, and it's bad for human capital accumulation by workers, but it's also bad for training by firms, and it's very bad for adjustment uh, and reallocation of, of capital and labor. So this is, a, this is a big problem. Spain has done quite a bit of progress over the last few years, and uh, it's, still, it's, still, uh, it's still a problem, in, I think, in many European countries. Luigi? Certainly, there is a lot of resistance, especially to technological change, uh, which is exacerbated by lack, a lack of growth. Because uh, if you are in an expanding industry, in an expanding sector, uh, productivity gains means to make more money for everybody. 
In, uh, if you are in a stagnant industry, in a stagnant firm, productivity gains means firing people and people losing their job. And surprise, surprise, in, in Europe, they're very resistant to that. So they make it very painful, and they're more successful in making painful uh, than, than in the American situation, uh, this resistance. And, and I think that's, that's a problem. Now, how do you fix it? You can try to uh, break the union by force. Uh, I don't think it's particularly sort of... Uh, uh, successful. The other is to try to bring growth back so that uh, the two things can take place at the same time. So I think there is a desperate need uh, of, of doing that. Um, in addition, there is the point that uh, Luis was uh, mentioned earlier. I think that uh, uh, the technological revolution has made managerial selection more important. And uh, in Southern Europe, but in particular in Italy, uh, managers at the top are not the best people around. Uh, there is the World Economic Forum, which is not this uh, uh, congregation of leftists that rank countries by um, whether people at the top of firms uh, are there because they are children of, or friends of, or because they're competent. And Italy is the last country in Europe below Bulgaria and a few others. So it, we're really doing terribly in that dimension. Why would you think, what do you think is the cause of that? Um, is that I a cultural that, thing? Uh, there is a part of a cultural thing. Uh, there is a part of... Less competition? Part of lack of competition, would... part of lack of competition. But what is interesting is that the European integration did not help very much. In fact, what you saw is Italians abandoned the certain competitive industry and retrenching more and more into public utilities where sort of a, you have the help of the government and so you can politically maintain uh, that, that system. And uh, I don't have this uh, view. Some of my countrymen think that uh, uh, Brussels or, or Frankfurt will bring a better system. Um, I'm much more uh, reluctant uh, in, in believing that. I uh, made a, in, in a little book I wrote in Italian an analogy between the North-South Italian unification in 1861 and the European unification. And they have a lot of points in common, um, including the fact that uh, uh, both were driven by a small elite and there was not a huge support. Uh, we know how the Italian unification ended, was the North dominating the South, the South losing all the productive capacity it had. Very few people know that Sicily had the same income per capita as uh, the area around Bologna at the time of unification, now has half of that uh, uh, sort of the income per capita. So there was a huge decline of the South. Why? Because the Northern imposed the rule to the South with the support of the rich people, the baron of the South, that uh, were interested in maintaining their power and not changing. And I fear that that's exactly what happens in Greece or in Italy. Uh, Greece has a similar problem in Italy. You need to get rid of the oligarchs in Greece. But who speaks English and goes to Brussels? The oligarchs. So if you are Brussels, you are going to get your information and your reforms directed from the oligarchs, not directed at changing the oligarchs. And I think in Italy it's the same. Nick, three things, if I may. Firstly, I think it's implied by something Luigi said that it's not necessarily so much that Europe has more regulation now than it did, say, 25 years ago. It's that the technological world has demanded a different sort or maybe less regulation. So the regulation has become more costly, but not necessarily, in a sense, more onerous or fully developed. And that was clear with IT, and it's obviously an issue with this AI-type technology and so on. Secondly, you asked, is it the case that these problems are similar across Europe? I think no. The answer is they're quite a bit different. Let's take the creative destruction, the measure we've got of allocative efficiency. Uh, countries like Sweden and Germany, on the standard ways we measure it, don't look that different from the United States. In Greece, you'd be better to distribute resources randomly. In other words, actually, uh, the, the employment, if you like, in the Greek economy is skewed towards lower productivity outcomes. That's got to be a system which is working extremely badly. Going to the issue of the worker threatened by losing their job, I think, again, there's a big difference between my caricature of Southern Europe and Northern Europe. In Southern Europe, I tend to see job protection 
in the sense of employment protection and so on. In Northern Europe, I see welfare states which are designed more to protect the worker. And so that has a different implication, I think, for the redeployment flexibility of the labor market. So you're saying in, the, in one case it's more directed toward protecting firms from their competitors, whereas the other it's cushioning the blow to the individuals in the aftermath? Yes, essentially. That, okay. or, maybe, or maybe even protecting jobs versus protecting workers. So in Southern Europe, it's that job that cannot change. In Northern Europe, is they, will, they will make sure that the worker has some welfare of some kind, but the job can be reallocated. Um, I, I, am, I am much more positive about the role that Brussels in the, the whole European project is, is, has had uh, in terms of, of, of regulation, etc., uh, in a place like Spain. Um, it is basically because of Europe that we have any competition policy. I mean, there, there's been historically a lot of chronic capitalism. Everybody's very connected. The connected people can get things done that the unconnected people cannot. And as Brussels is more remote and there is a more neutral referee, there is a much more... There are rules that come from Brussels that are neutral, that impose certain standards that the whole economy can, can undertake. And in fact, uh, Brexit has something to do with that. Uh, I don't want to be facetious about it, but Murdoch said, you know, when I pick up the phone and I call a British minister, um, they always answer. When I call Brussels, uh, nobody pays attention to me. I mean, the four foreign owners of huge <laughs> newspapers in the UK have been on a, on a campaign to get the UK out of the, out of the euro, out of Europe, and, and, to, a lot, and to some extent, uh, it's for the, because Europe was working in, in that way. So Europe does have the advantage of giving a common set of rules, a level playing field, a big market where we compete, and it has, in the case of Spain, it has been a, an unambiguously very good factor for the modernization of the economy. So we have, we have two, two anecdotes here uh, that conflict. We have Murdoch's inability to influence Brussels, but we have the Greek uh, or Italian was Italian oligarchs who were ru- running wild and making policies. But how, how wild did they run in, in Italy, in Greece <laughs> itself? No, no, I, th- I, I, think, I think that uh, there is no doubt that uh, there are some things that are positive about the European rules impose, and they impose sort of a, uh, more competition. For example, the, the impossibility of doing industrial politics, policy and politics, uh, in the fact that in the United States, states compete on... Uh, a subsidy, tax subsidy to businesses in Europe is impossible to do it. So yeah. I think that that shows that in some dimension Europe is, is much, much better. Yeah. But when you talk about, maybe it is my southern it, it sort of uh, origin, but uh, in, uh, if you look at the sort of uh, impartial referee, I don't see the referee to be so impartial. I was at a conference of uh, financial economists in Europe, uh, again, not a bunch of leftists, uh, and I ask around the room and say, uh, who do you think that uh, if Deutsche Bank were to go under, that wouldn't they find a way to save it by passing the rules? So bailing out and not bailing in anybody. Exactly. And nobody wanted to, ra- to say that they wouldn't. So the Everyone answer, agreed they would. they would. Deutsche Bank would be saved. Exactly. Absolutely. So, I feel the same way, no, and but, I know but, nothing about it. Yeah, but, but you see, <laughs> but my so, instincts so, are so like that, theirs. Then they're not impartial rules. This is a sort of a... Is a I know it's an illusion of impartiality. This is a, 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 ten, a, a, a sort of a difficult thing to say in America, but there is a, a rationality in the American Constitution that attributes two senators to every state. Right? Even sort of Wyoming, that has more cows than people, has basically the same power as New York. And why is that the case? To rebalance the disproportionate power of the strongest state. That was Virginia at the beginning, yeah. and then it would have been New York, and maybe that would be California. I okay? think that's easy to say in America, and I think it sounds better with an Italian accent. <laughs> but in Europe, it's not that, that way. First of all, we don't have a president of Europe. We have very many people say, oh, Merkel is the president of Europe. No, Merkel is elected by German people, right. and she follows the interests of German people. And, and, and she would be stupid of doing otherwise, because she's elected on that basis. So she's not acting in the interests of Europe, she's acting in the interests of Germany. And One that, would expect that. Exactly. And, yeah. that, and, and she has a disproportionate power in all decisions. So the, the, we are creating a bias that makes it more difficult, actually, to introduce rules, because then the locals justify all their sort of shenanigans and say, oh, the rules are rigged, 
And that's the reason why we don't have to obey the rules. I disagree with that, Luigi. It's a bit like the US, uh, like the Trump situation right now, right? There, there is an hegemon in Europe, which is Germany, but it has been a benign hegemon because of its traditional, because of its history of war and everything, and because it has the biggest stake in maintaining peace. So it has actually, yes, like the US and international system, it was more powerful and it was the, doing whatever it wanted, but it was kind of having an enlightened view of its own self-interest longer term. Now the U.S. has decided not to have that view, uh, which is scary for all of us, of course. And, and in Germany, happily, because of the history, I think they do have an enlightened view of their self-interest, which happily, until now, means that largely they are kind of containing that, that abuse of power. That it's, the possibility is there, for sure. Well, re- recording this at the Hoover Institution, I, I, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but I'll put a link up to the right quote uh, for listeners, which is, Milton Friedman said, um, you don't want a political system that relies on the right people getting into office. You want a political system that allows bad people to come to office, but where they're encouraged to do the right thing. And I think it's nice. There are some historical, uh, what we would call, um, I don't know, uh, trends that were that were helpful in that case. Maybe Germany didn't follow its own self-interest or Merkel didn't follow her own self-interest quite as much as she might have had her country had a different history. But I think going forward... Something I want to rely on. That's all I think would be the be the key point. I want to, I want to ask kind of a crazy question, um, which is how much of Europe's problems are not problems, but preferences. So a friend of mine was recently in Italy, and he showed me some gorgeous pictures he took in Florence. And you look down, it's you know you have this beautiful, incredible Brunelleschi's dome of the church there, looking down over these gorgeous rooftops. And I assume it looks something like it looked. 400, 600 years ago. And I thought, you know, it's a fan- this city is a fantastic museum. It has fantastic museums, but the whole city is a museum. It's a way to experience life at a certain point. And then I thought, well, gee, you know, it's kind of hard to have growth in a museum. The technology of providing a museum is pretty straightforward. And the services that, that, that Florence uh, provides are, you know, tourism, services to each other. They're not going to grow very much if they keep that beautiful infrastructure that they have. I think there are probably some people there who like that, and there are probably some people who don't. Um, we have the same issue here in the United States to some extent. Um, you know, whether we should become more like Europe, a bunch of people wish we became more like Europe, a little less dynamic, a little more static, a little more protection to people who are struggling. What are your thoughts about that in terms of going forward, or whether... And we can sit around here, we haven't got to it really, talk about what Europe could do to grow faster, but maybe it doesn't, maybe they don't want to. There's no they. Maybe there are many, there's a strong constituency among the European people to keep life as it is. I, I profoundly disagree. Good. I think that, uh, Just first of all, in California, today is not a good day, but in California there is as much sun as in Sicily. And people say that Sicilians don't walk because there is sun, but in California people walk very hard and they have the Silicon Valley in spite of the sun. So I think that uh, some of these stereotypes are, are right, sort yes. of false. Yeah. Uh, it's true that uh, Italy, in many things, is a museum, it's a beautiful museum, but number one, you need to preserve that museum, and we do a terrible job doing that. Pompeii is falling apart. And technology can be used to save Pompeii. Technology can be used to make the experience more interesting. I actually went uh, a couple of years ago uh, during the summer in Rome, and they had a, a show where they used technology to uh, illuminate during the night part of the uh, Roman for- forum. To recreate what it looked to like in a way what that, yeah. it was. It was in fantastic. It was phenomenal. So you can do stuff Great point. that is amazing and respecting the past. And uh, I think that uh, the only thing I agree with you is that there are some people who don't want to make this change. Why? Because they have a little rent they are protecting. Sure. I, Luis, I think you're more right than, than, Luigi, than, Luigi, than Luigi grants you. Um, the political economy of the changes, I, I've been, for, for the last uh, couple of years, I've been the main policy advisor to a, to a, to a centrist party in Spain. It's a, a new centrist party. And, and the the thing that you notice is a lot of things that you think can be done when you try to really dig out what the constituency is, uh, you discover it's just not there. The political economy is really important. I think people are uh, as rational as we, as we grant them, and they understand things as well as we grant them. Example for me is education. The educational system in Spain is bad. Our PISA results are, are 
terrible, these, these international comparisons, the university system is, is poor. So you would think, I'm going to go there and explain people, let me be naive, and explain people how this is a bad system and how it can be improved, and then people are going to say, oh yeah, let's change it. The truth of the matter is the society is pretty old. The median voter is 50 years old. You want to spend money in health, and you want to spend money in pensions. And to be honest, people say, yeah, yeah, education is good, but you notice that when you make a proposal on that, or it just doesn't resonate. The other, the other things maybe resonate, maybe. But this, at the end of the day, the median voter thinks, you know, education, yeah, man, it's a big problem, but... So, Luis, you're absolutely right if you talk about age. I'm not saying that the reason why they're reluctant to change is because they have a beautiful Brunelleschi there. Okay, <laughs> okay. That, that, that was my only point. Okay. If you're right. saying that all the people don't want change and you're always getting old, and as a result, as a consequence, we don't want change, I'm 100% with you. Nick? The problem you posed, I think, has a pretty focal point, or has had in the literature, namely that Europeans work a lot less hours per year than Americans. Uh, one of the reasons for that is they have more vacations uh, when you actually dig into the numbers. Uh, my colleagues perhaps know more about this than me, and I'd be interested to know what they got to say. But last time I looked at the literature, it seemed still to be a bit undecided. How far is that somehow to do with the tax system, and how far is it to do with a higher leisure preference? Uh, the literature has some support for each of those views, I think. Just going back to whether Europeans like growth or not, I don't know. But they certainly like the proceeds of growth. <laughs> so if you want to have higher living standards, the issue is how to use the proce proceeds of growth well. That's, I think, the debate that the Europeans need to have. Actually, in terms of numbers of hours worked per week, Greece works much more than Germany, for example. So it's yeah. not true that uh, uh, the South works less than the North, no, I didn't or places say that. with more ruins or better sort of statues, they work less. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that. I know, I know. I just wanted to uh, underline this fact. So people like to uh, note my optimism from time to time. Um, 2017, for me, is a challenging time to be optimistic. <laughs> uh, I want to focus on one issue, and we're going to close with this. We've got about five, ten more minutes. Uh, the growth in what we would call populism, the growth in what we would call uh, anti-globalization, uh, seems to be very powerful in Europe. Uh, we see it starting to rise here in the United States. Of course, there's no way of knowing how widespread the, under, the deep underlying support we recently had an election in the United States, and uh, it's the blind man and the elephant. You know, everybody's grabbing the part of the elephant that they want to sell as the underlying cause. And it's simple, you know, I think you have to recognize that it's incredibly complicated. And you have a very uncompetitive system with two candidates that are both very flawed. And so I'm not sure we can make strong conclusions that are going to persist for the United States. And yet, I look in Europe and I see very similar trends. So talk about that and what you think that that portends for uh, economic policy going forward. Luis. So I would, <laughs> to me, it is technology. I mean, I think people are anxious. I, I think... Um, Say anxious. Yeah, I think um, it's true that technology has always been hitting the lower end of the, of the wage distribution, but now um, the loss of routine jobs, uh, manual and intellectual routine jobs, is really hitting um, and making very uncomfortable a lot of people who were the, just the middle classes. The wage polarization, a lot of people in the middle, um, as work by Kevin Murphy and by others has shown, haven't seen wage growth for a long time. And essentially what, what that means is there was, there was an regression. Let me just pick the piece of the elephant I like. Uh, showing in the U.S. the share of routine jobs in the county was a very good predictor of the share of Trump voters. If you are a lawyer or a ideologist or if you're a truck driver or if you are a taxi driver, I mean, there's a lot of people who are really insecure and uncertain about the future, who see a future that is precarious and who see a future that, uh, in which they're going to have to recycle or change or think of new things. And what they want is to stop this process. I want to get out. And stopping or, this or, process... Or they want someone to champion them in a, yes. in a different way. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think they want to stop the process. They think this globalization thing is going the wrong way. They think it's globalization instead of technology. They think it has to do with, with trade. I think trade is a tiny 
cha tiny component or a small component of that. And, 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 and they think if we could just stop this and I could just continue to be exactly like I am now, uh, or at least continue like the trend I was in, that would be much better. And that's, I think that's the one common thing that you can tell about the UK and France and Holland and the US that is not unemployment levels, it's not growth rates, it's not productivity. Uh, to me, populism is uncertainty about the future. Yeah. One of the things we do know is something about who voted for Brexit compared with those who didn't. We only know it really on the level of composition of spatial areas, particular districts, but it tells you quite a lot. Districts which are old, districts which have very low levels of education, districts which are in the bottom quartile of uh, income per person, uh, disproportionately voted for leave. And in many of those constituencies, uh, the vote for leave was around 70%, if, if a district had all those characteristics. I think if I was a voter in, I don't know if this resonates in the US, somewhere like Burnley, a very run-down former cotton mill town in Lancashire. Mm. I'd raise that old Monty Python question, what has the EU ever done for me? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'd find it... It's an inside it joke, but we'll put a link up to the clip. You can get it on, <laughs> on YouTube, and it's delightful. Well, and I hope roads. I've quoted it. Yeah, right. yeah it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, and actually yeah. the EU has done rather more for them than they might think, mm -hmm. so it's not a, a totally inapposite remark. But I think this is the notion of the left-behind voter. One last thing that uh, hadn't been known until one of my colleagues discovered it in a paper, uh, in, in researching this, is that areas which suffered disproportionately from austerity in the form of local public finance cuts uh, also were predisposed to go towards Brexit. And that says something about the social safety net uh, aspect of all this. Luigi? So I agree that this, uh, this anxiety over technology, I think that uh, uh, I always said that David Arthur has this paper showing that uh, only 10% of the jobs lost in manufacturing are lost to China, it means that 90% are lost to technology. But campaigning against the iPhone is not a good thing. <laughs> campaigning against China, <laughs> China a yeah. is, is a winner. So I think that uh, there is definitely that uh, anxiety. And, and I think that uh, we tend to be a bit too removed from that anxiety, and so we don't uh, uh, empathize enough. I think as ac academics, we should pay more attention to this. And the other thing that uh, we underestimate there is now all this talk about fake news, but in reality is that uh, in the past, the elites were much better at controlling the narrative because Who there was... Better? Second. The elites were the much elites, better yeah. at controlling narratives because there were few centers of production. Now, with the Internet, you can uh, run a video and uh, put it up there and tell a different story. Okay, and when the story is... We, is, is we what, the elites, used to say more the truth, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I actually disagree. If, if I look at the facts, especially no, in Italy, I completely disagree with that. Which, why, what and, do you mean, Luigi? What are you saying? If you read the newspapers and you read, uh, for example... Um, I give you a practical example. The, the other day, I received through some friends a video of somebody from the Five Star Movement that was taping a session of the Senate and describing what was happening in the Senate. Uh, the next day, you read vaguely a reference of this in the newspaper. And uh, during the uh, vote for the bailout of banks, basically, which were giving some money to the banks, they inserted a $97 million for the Ryder Cup of golf as part of the system. Now, why golfing is so important in Italy, and why did you give $97 million, and why this is part of the bank bailout? Nobody understood. Well, I have the answer, though. <laughs> the answer is just it's the same reason in the TARP bill that it was our bailout, right? Mm -hmm. We had a thing to subsidize electric car batteries that only happened to be one kind of car. Okay. It happened to be the American manufacturer that was being used. And, uh, yeah. yeah, but opportunity but, knocks. But golf is not even a popular sport in Italy. The Ryder <laughs> Cup are not your mechanics. Yeah. It's a very particular elite, and you don't yeah, understand. Fair yeah. So, uh, but this like stuff that. was not well reported in the newspaper, right. and the Five Star Movement was circulating this what is all that? over the, the place. What the Five Star Movement is Beppe Grillo. The populist. Uh, is actually, to be honest, by 
US or UK standard is much less populist than Trump. So I think that uh, and is not uh, racist. So I think there is a, a, a you, you have to revalue. I always said that uh, is the only honest politician because he's a comedian from the beginning uh, and it turned into politics. Most politicians are comedian, but they're not professional ones. He's, yeah. he's like a, a professional one. So I think he does it better. I guess I guess Trump uh, <laughs> makes us all revalue our political system to feel very proud. I guess that's a, that's a good part of Trump. So let's close. Any optimism here? Uh, we, we're kind of in a dark space. Um, anybody have anything good to say about the future of Europe that's encouraging? We've got corruption, cronyism, bad regulations, I, I uh, falling let, let, apart building think, with no fire escape. I think the year. I think the year is really, really important because of the French election yeah. and the German election. I think there is a way the year turns into a an extraordinarily good year for Europe with Macron being elected as French president and a new coalition in Germany uh, that would totally shift around uh, the equilibrium towards doing some of the things that Luigi has described as being impossible, suddenly becoming possible, uh, su- suddenly becoming possible. Uh, I, I think that it could, it could actually go for the, worst, for the best. It's also possible, it has to be said, that Le Pen wins in France and the whole European project is over. But, uh, I mean, that's yeah. just well, smaller. Well, something interesting. Any other quick comments? paper Nick. I contributed for this conference, I used the title Making Europe Great Again, yeah. with a big question mark <laughs> after it. The conclusion of the paper is that's a Herculean task. Yeah. Luigi? Um, I'm not an optimist by nature, so it's very hard for me to conclude. <laughs> I want to add one part that uh, we have not touched because we tend not to touch this, but it's very important, and it's the migrant problem mm-hmm. in Europe. I think it's gigantic. It's not perceived here, but uh, involves also geopolitics. Uh, the Europe paid a lot of money to Erdogan to keep the Syrians out of Europe. Uh, of course, this has impact on democracy in Turkey and stuff like that. And uh, it just happens, this is just bad luck, it just happens that the, the big burden of, of uh, this is suffered by the countries that are more in economic trouble. It didn't have to be that way, but that's the case. And uh, uh, I think I admire greatly Merkel for her uh, sort of attitude initially when she was open to that. Yeah. Uh, she understood that if she continued that way, she would not be re-elected, so she changed dramatically. I think is is a big, big uh, source of uh, additional problem. So my last name. You try to make him be optimistic. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> but I'm going to give him. A, I'm going to throw him a a, a a cheerful thing. You know, my last name starts with an R, so I'm sympathetic to people whose last names are toward the end of the alphabet. So I'm going to thank my guests in reverse alphabetical <laughs> order: Luigi Zingali, Luis Caracano, and Nicholas Crafts. Thank you for being part of Econ Talk. It's a pleasure. So. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.